morning, everyone. Fantastic. Wonderful to meet you here, and it's such a great privilege to speak at a CB event, the Council of Biblical Equality. I first came across them about two years ago and they do an amazing job. So thank you very much, Marg, and to Lynn and to Leslie for hosting me and also to Paul in his absence. But CBE uh, does a wonderful job of promoting gender equality in the church, both in Australia and internationally. So I commend their work to you. But it's fantastic to meet you all. I was 21 years old. I had been in church all of my life, attended the Sunday services. I'd read my Bible almost from cover to cover in the King James Version, if you don't mind. I had kept all of the Ten Commandments, perhaps all of them, except for one time when I swore in grade six and I felt guilty for a week afterwards. But I was a good Christian girl, but I had never heard God speak to me. I didn't know what it meant to hear his voice. And when I was 21 years old, I discovered that God was a living God. He wanted a personal relationship with us. And my question was, well, if I can hear God speak, what does he sound like? And what sort of things would he say? It captured my imagination. I thought, wow, imagine a two-way conversation with the creator of the universe. What would he speak about my life? What sort of things would he say? The God who knows everything that's happened in my past and understands and holds the future, what does that look like? And so I began to ask God, would you teach me what you sound like? Do you have a big booming voice or a soft mystical whisper? Do you have an accent? Do you speak Australian? <laughs> and if you do speak, how would I know it's you? So I began to pray. I said, God, would you teach me what you sound like? Would you speak to me? And he did. And it was out of those conversations over the years that he led me from being a school teacher to become a pastor. He led me to be involved in lots of different forms of ministry and missions work and in youth work and also to pioneer my own church and work in a couple of different Bible colleges. And then nine years ago, he spoke to me and said, what I want you to do is I want you to take everything you've learnt about hearing from me and pass it on to others. And so the Ministry of God Conversations was born. That's what I do now. I travel around Australia and overseas and I teach people how to recognise God's voice. It's such an important part of our discipleship and our Christian walk. But the interesting thing about it is that my conversations with God also led me to have a very different idea of his view towards men and women. God spoke to me about what it meant to have gender equality and that in itself completely changed my life. And when I talk to you today from the perspective of a person who's negotiated some of these things as a single person, you may think to yourself, what connection is there between singleness and gender equality? How does this fit? Well, I believe there's some really important theological understandings that I want to look at today to see how we can actually understand God's heart for both men and women in every season of life, regardless of their gender, and regardless of their marital status. And in order to negotiate some of the pastoral issues that come up as a result of being single, these understandings about God's heart towards men and women, I believe, need to be established first. So we're going to talk about that topic today. I was 26 years old when God called me into ministry. He made me a promise. He said, Tanya, I'm calling you to be in ministry with your husband. Wow. I was so excited. My heart was to serve God. I'd always wanted to serve God. I'd always loved God and I wanted to do something for him. And I wanted to get married. I thought, this is fantastic. When I grow up, I'm going to be a pastor's wife. <laughs> in the church that I grew up in, that was the only option. Or I could be a missionary. I tried that. And God wasn't asking me to be a missionary. But the process goes on. And over time, he led me to a new church. And as I shifted to that church, horror of horrors, the pastor, who I happen to particularly like, resigned. And a new pastor came in. And the pastor was a woman. 
My whole, entire background told me that this was wrong. So now I had a massive dilemma. I was being led by a pastor who I didn't think should be there. And what's more, God spoke to me. He said, she's going to mentor you. You're going to be raised up here in leadership and you're going to work here one day a week. It was a few weeks later that during a ministry time, she came up to me and she said, God has spoken to me. I'm going to mentor you here. Um, you're going to be raised up in leadership. You're going to work here one day a week. So God was doing something, but it was a problem. Because as I said, I didn't believe that she should be doing what she was doing and I didn't believe that I should be doing what I was doing. <laughs> but God had spoken. We began to negotiate some of those issues. I went to Bible college. I started to work through some of the questions I had about those passages in the Bible, the familiar ones from 1 Timothy 2, which you know about, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 14, that at first read appear to limit us from what women can do in the church. And I began to reconcile those things with the backdrop, the, con the context of first century Greco-Roman world and understand that actually God's heart was for release for both both men and women. Time goes on and then he spoke to me again. He said, I'm calling you to pioneer a church. I thought, fantastic, because now my husband's going to come along <laughs> because everyone need, knows that you need a husband to plan a church, right? Right. Have you ever seen someone pioneer a church as a single woman? I haven't. I remember going to those pastors' conferences and they would acknowledge the pioneers amongst us and they would talk about, yeah, it's so challenging to plant a church and they would bring them up stage, heroes of the faith, and they would honour them and the man would get the microphone and he'd say, oh, thank God that he's done such a great thing, but I want to thank my beautiful wife because I couldn't have done it without her. <laughs> See? <laughs> and, then, and then you'd go to weddings and during the speeches, they'd stand up and they'd read the scriptures. Ecclesiastes, two are better than one. Because if one falls down, you've got someone else to pick you up. Pity the person who has no one to pick them up. I tried quoting that scripture to God. My final argument, I believe, was a good one. I was teaching at Bible college at the time. I was, there was a subject there called how to plant a church and it had a textbook that was written by our denominational experts on how to do it. And the first chapter was a list of essentials you need to plant a church. The first one, well, there were things in there like a strong team, some money, but the first one, the top one, pastor and his wife. It appeared that God hadn't read the textbook, <laughs> or at least he didn't care about the textbook. He said to me, I want you to do it on your own. Wow. He's not coming. The dreaded words, not yet. <laughs> Worst words I've ever heard from God. <laughs> what? What do you mean, not yet? That's not fair. Everyone else gets a husband. I don't want to pastor a church and pioneer a church. Um, haven't you heard how hard it is? I was furious. So we had a discussion. I said, well, at least you can do is explain to me why. And I can still remember the moment when he spoke to me. I was driving to my work one morning. And as I was driving along, a, a picture, a very clear picture formed in my mind the picture was of a penny farthing bicycle. And the words that came with it were this, that's the old fashioned way. I knew it was God and immediately I knew exactly what it meant. I knew that I would be the small wheel and that if I got married now, my husband would be the large wheel. And I knew that if I got married then, at that point, it would stay that way. See, I'd been raised to see no other model. It was what I'd been taught all my life. And I cried and I wrestled and I argued. And the reason I did was because I didn't want to grow up. I wanted to stay that small wheel. I wanted to stay in the model I'd seen all my life. And God was calling me to rise up, to discover that I had a call and I had gifts and I had a destiny regardless of whether 
I was married or not. That's the heartbeat of what I want to share with you this morning. Because we're going to talk about some of the pastoral issues, some of the emotional issues that come with the seasons of life when we are single. But I think some of the problems that we face in our attitudes towards singleness derive from this very idea that we have about gender equality and what it means to partner with men and women on the planet. What does it mean to be co equal image bearers, being given the planet to steward together, made in God's image. And we're going to have a look at it in a few different ways. We're going to look at some sociological uh, issues surrounding this topic. We're going to look at the psychological ones, and we're also going to look at the theological ones. And then my, my hope is that as we move from there, that we'll have a look at some of the emotional and the pastoral issues that come with this topic. Society has changed a lot in the last 15 to 20 years. I don't know if you've noticed, but singleness is now more prominent than it ever has been in history. Some of the statistics you may find interesting in Australia, 2011, the ABS released some statistics that said 51% of people in Australia are unmarried. The US mirrors similar statistics. In 2009, the number of single women for the first time outnumbered the number of married women in the population. As Rebecca Traister said, for young women, for the first time, it's as normal to be unmarried as it is to be married, even if it doesn't feel that way. Isn't that interesting? Half the population now. In Australia, the number of lone person household is the fastest growing demographic. Two million people are solo dwellers in Australia. The world has changed (coughs) dramatically and singleness is now much more prominent in society than it ever used to be. But what about in the church? (coughs) Interestingly, a study in the UK in 2014 showed that the church doesn't always reflect those statistics. In Great Britain, 60% of people in church are married compared to 47% of the population. You could ask yourself, why is that? (laughs) Well, there, there could be a couple of factors. Perhaps it is that God is bringing people together in church much more. After all, marriage was his idea. And perhaps that's happening more in church life. Or the other side of it is perhaps singles are staying away. That's the other side of it as well. But in my own experience, which is very much anecdotal, I found the responses to this uh, fairly consistent across the world. You see, for many of us, this whole rise of singleness is not really, hasn't really been noted. It's, it's kind of, we're not really aware of it in church life. The goal is marriage, and so we don't really talk about singles a great deal. I've been in church, as I said, all my life, and, I, and I've sat in I don't know how many sermons about marriage. And in the early days in my 20s, I would be the one taking copious notes, writing all the tips down as much as I possibly could. And then as time got on, I started taking less and less notes. And now, I don't listen at all. <laughs> but I have very, very rarely heard singleness talked about. It's, it's kind of talked about in the way, well, one day, don't worry about it, you'll get married. <laughs> keep trusting God, keep hoping. But no one ever taught us, well, how do I manage this season in a healthy way? So to some degree, it's been neglected. And I think part of that is because singles are underrepresented in church life. It's true. I don't know many single pastors in leadership, in in church leadership. That's not the model that we have. And if there are, no one really wants to talk about it. I remember receiving my first invitation to speak about this topic like, are you kidding me? Don't you want to learn about how to hear God's voice? Because who wants to be the poster girl for singleness? <laughs> Yay. I know, what, I know what every young woman's thinking. Lord, please don't make me like her. <laughs> You're awesome, son. <laughs> but then I realised that no one else was talking about it. If 50% of the population is single, where's the leadership in this? Recently, a friend alerted me to a Facebook post. A prominent US minister had put a meme up giving some advice to singles. Well, 
Do you see the eruption that followed of comments from singles? How dare you say things like that? You got married in your early 20s. What would you know? And then I realised that someone has to talk about these things and that maybe I could do some of it at least. But we need to bring leadership. We need to understand that singles have a place and if nothing else, to reflect the population. The other thing I think that we encounter in the church is a degree of confusion. See, we come from a very patriarchal society. Historically, that's been the only model that we've ever known. And if we understand that the, the idea that if God's design was for man to be the head, if God's design is man to be the leader and the authority and for woman to be the subordinate in that role, if that is our understanding, that has been the understanding for years, then what do we do with a woman particularly who's got no head. It's a headless person running around. And so I had interesting reactions when I was pastoring my church as a single. People would look over my shoulder, particularly at pastors' conferences. Where, what, what, you on your own? Uh, are you in rebellion? <laughs> they'd look for the ring on my finger and they'd see it wasn't there and then they'd kind of change the topic and walk away. Confusion. I don't know what to do with you because that's not the model I've ever seen. This is a new thing and I, I don't understand how this works. So we need to talk about some of these things. When I was early in my journey to ministry, God spoke to me again about his purpose for this particular journey that he had for me. I was jogging on the footpath and I can still remember the point of what he spoke to me, coming down the hill, pounding the pavement, and the Holy Spirit said these words to me. He said, I want to release you from the effects of the curse. Well, what does that mean? I ran home, jumped in the shower, got changed out of my running gear and opened up my Bible to Genesis chapter 3, 16. Whoops, there it is. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. This is the passage that talks about the effect of the fall on mankind. And this particular verse, your desire for your husband will be for your husband and he will rule over you. What was God talking about? I didn't fully understand at the time. I thought maybe, well, this is the curse. This, is, this, is, this could be because I really want a date on, sun, on Saturday night and, and I don't have one, so that's a curse, <laughs> perhaps. A popular understanding of the time and what I was raised with came from a scholar by the name of Susan Foe, and she was a person who believed in hierarchy in relationships and hierarchy in marriage. In, in that model, the man was the head, the boss, he was the one in charge, and the woman was the assistant. And so she interpreted this line to mean that the desire for the woman would be the desire to control and usurp authority from the man, and that the man would rule over her, that he would rule in a way that was unhealthy and domineering. And that was the curse. As time went on, I began to understand a different meaning to that verse. You see, in Genesis chapter 1, when God created humanity, he created them together to rule the planet. And what we see is a beautiful unity and synergy that's happening there. Then sin enters and hierarchy occurs. We now have a battle of the sexes. We now have a situation where there's an argument about who's in charge, who has the power. But God's heart was always unity. God's heart was always working together as one, not one having authority over the other. But the curse has had its impact all throughout the world, all throughout history, all throughout different cultures. And this thinking of patriarchy has been deeply embedded in our understanding, both in the external structures, in the sociological structures of our world, but also internally in the psychological beliefs we hold about ourselves. It's deeply entrenched. So let's have a look at some of those external structures that have become such a part of our world. The truth is, is that patriarchy has existed all throughout history. It's, it's deeply embedded in how we think. Leadership is male. For many of us, that's all we've ever known. And one of the um, examples of that that came to mind is a 18th century law, English common law, the law of coverture. Has anyone ever heard of this? 
This law says that once a woman gets married, her legal, social and economic identity is subsumed by the man's. To become one, yes, but one loses their rights, their identity. And that had incredible implications. A woman couldn't own property. She had no legal rights. She couldn't keep her own earnings. And her, her name being given away was a symbol of that. She couldn't function independently. This law has been a part of our system for so long. In fact, it was interesting reading about this law of coverture and reflecting on the doctrine of covering, which somehow we managed to find from 1 Corinthians 11, which is really a passage about head coverings. <laughs> Do you know what passage I'm talking about? That's the background that we have in society, deeply entrenched, deeply ingrained. And the church, of course, being a product of society, we've also taken on board that, that, um, that ideal. So we see denominations and we see uh, different churches handling this at a different level. So some denominations limit women at the top level, some are further down. Women can't always be ordained. In, in my denomination, you can be. It's been like that from the beginning. But there's still this idea that leadership is male. It's still a hangover. So even in the, one of the most egalitarian denominations that we have, Salvation Army, amazing, co-founded by a woman, they've always been very free and releasing of women that if you were an officer in the Salvation Army and you married and you're at a certain level, a certain rank, you would have to lower your ranking to match your husband's if he was lower than you. Patriarchy, very much entrenched in our society, in society and in the church. And that means that our culture imbibes that, our expectations imbibe it. And so we, we, we can't escape it. It's real. It's there. It's the only model that we've ever known. So those people that would get confused by me and, and they look at me and wonder how it works, it, it's, they're just reflecting what they've always known. They weren't being mean. They weren't attacking me. But they're just like, oh, I haven't seen this before and in fact I, I do it too. If I'm in a mixed group of pastors naturally I will divert my attention to the male because he's always the one that used to have the authority regardless of their position. That's what and I've had to rewire some of my thinking so the structures of society have been set up for this but at the same time those structures have been internalized within ourselves. We've taken on those beliefs and they've formed a part of our identity and I think that this is a really important uh, truth to acknowledge. So even though patriarchy may be in our society, even when we remove those laws, we still have the hangover because those ideas have been internalised. I found this when I was on my ministry journey. God had released me to be in ministry. I was in a church who believed in me. But the limitations now were inside of myself. I'd taken them on board because that's all I'd ever seen. When I, when I looked at myself, I was an assistant. I was a follower. I wasn't a leader. So I remember very clearly when I first moved to my church where the woman was the senior pastor. Her husband was a businessman. And I remember watching my mentor, Melinda, as she would preach. I'd never heard a woman preach before, so that was a bit odd. But then I watched her lead and she was strong and she was good at decision making and strategic and visionary. And she'd talk about how she changed the world. And I remember just being so confused because all the women I'd ever known were passive. They were beautiful women but they were soft and gentle and they didn't lead. And so when it came to myself, I didn't believe that I could either. And so the question was, well, how do I do this, God? Who, who am I as a woman? I'm not used to this. It's a bit like the turtle in the fish tank. You know, you put a baby turtle in a small fish tank, he won't grow. He just become adjust to the, to the environment that he's in. You take him out, put him in the river, he grows. It's just like us. We've, we've used to a certain way of operating. So that also becomes an issue that God had to work through. And for singles, this becomes an issue as well. Messages that are sent particularly, and I'm speaking from the perspective of a woman right now, some of the key messages we were sent was you need a man to fulfil your destiny. You, you can't live the fullness of what God has for you without marriage. My church told me that. My home background told me that. If man was the head, I needed one <laughs> and I wouldn't be able to fulfil my purpose without it. But again, it's not just in the church. This is how it's been 
for a long time and the writer Nora Ephron, I came across this quote. It says, we weren't meant to have futures. She's speaking about her class in the 1960s, her graduating class. She'd gone to university and this was her conclusion. We weren't meant to have futures. We were meant to marry them. We weren't meant to have politics or careers that mattered or opinions or, or lives. We were meant to marry them. If you wanted to be an architect, you married an architect. If you wanted to be a pastor, you... Exactly. So what does this mean for singles? Particularly single women. <sighs> waiting around. Waiting for a man to fulfil their destiny. We're told that we need a man, we need a partner to feel good about ourselves. Traster says that marriage has become the ratifying stamp of self-worth. So we look at our society today and George Clooney before he got married was the man. But Jennifer Aniston, poor Jen. <laughs> if marriage is the ultimate, if, if that's the stamp of self-worth, what does it mean for singles? If women are waiting for men to, to marry and to start their destiny, what does it mean about what they're doing in the meantime? They're designing their wedding dress. <laughs> Interesting, reading about the Bechdel test, designed about 15 years ago. Anyone heard it? It's an attest that when you apply it to a work of fiction, it's designed to um, assess the nature of that fiction, three criteria to pass the test. In the, in the movie or the book or the story, you must have at least two women. They must talk to each other about something other than a man. <laughs> they must be named. 2013, the Bechdel test was applied to the top grossing films of that year and only half of them passed. <laughs> If our whole society is built on this idea that you need for a woman to have a man, then what does that mean about singles? What does that mean about the one who isn't married? What about the men? See, the curse affected the women, but it also affected the men. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. I remember once I was preaching in a church and preached a sermon and after the sermon I made a, a call for prayer. Anyone like to receive prayer? And there was a really amazing response. Quite a number of people came to the front. About 12 or 13 people came to the front. 11 of them were women. One man. And I remember reflecting on it afterwards thinking, why? This was not a gender specific sermon. This was about faith and about living the God life. And I remember talking to people afterwards and the, and the men received the message as well as the women. What, were, what was going on there? Now, it could have been that I didn't have credibility in their eyes, but this church was a, always receiving of women in leadership. Why weren't the men responding? Carolyn Custis James in her book Maelstrom talks extensively about the impact of the curse on men. And she talks about the fact that manhood and masculinity is defined in terms of leadership over others. He will rule over you. And in the same way that it's enshrined in our sociological structures, it affects their psyche. And it results in this, in this definition, this identity coming from the use of power. The use of power to get what I need. And the result of that is violence, aggression particularly when that power is taken away. found it interesting that research shows that wherever women are at national decision-making levels in nations, they are five times less likely to use military intervention to resolve conflict on a national scale. The curse affected men too. The curse of patriarchy that, enabled, that said that your identity is found in this particular role has affected us as a society. But what, what is God doing? See, the truth is that the curse affected us. Sin affected us. But Jesus came to reverse the effects of, this, of the curse. Galatians talks about that. Jesus came to set the captives free. Jesus came to free us from the effects of sin and the curse. He did that in my life. But it's interesting, I was reading about a tribe in Albania, the mountains of Albania, and they found a way to get free from the curse. 
I'm not sure I would advocate this as a method. <laughs> There's a very small group of women, they're called Bernishas, uh, translated to mean he, she people. And they make a choice that they will take a vow of celibacy and that they will live and work and dress as men. But in doing that, in making that choice, they inherit all the rights and privileges that a man does. They get to make decisions, they get to own property, they get to look after their family estate. This is a woman here. The alternative as a woman in that tribe is to marry someone who's 40 or 50 years older than you, to be all your life be told what to do, to follow instructions, to have no freedom to make decisions. They become men. It's an interesting way to get free of the curse, isn't it? Not a very nice option, I believe. But I remember reflecting on that story and thinking, oh, well, God did something similar with me. He asked me to be single for a certain season to free me from the effects of the curse. See, the truth is that I didn't have the strength or the motivation to overcome some of those limitations, both that society imposed on me and that I believed about myself. And God wanted to show me something. He wanted to show me what his model was. He wanted to break me out of that penny-farthing idea so that I wouldn't stay small, so that I would discover who I was in God but very quickly I began to realise that this wasn't just something that he had for me, but it was something that he was doing amongst his people worldwide. He was wanting to set people free from the effects of the curse. He was wanting to make a statement about what his heart was, to say that regardless of whether we are single and whether we are married, and marriage is a, be marriage is a beautiful thing. It's a, it was designed by God and in, in its best ideal, it's two people partnering together, fulfilling the call of God together. But for me, I had internalised so many beliefs. For me, I desperately wanted to get married because I didn't want to face my fear. I didn't want to face my insecurity. I didn't want to break out of that mould that I had experienced all my life. And as I went on God's journey, I learned a number of things that I believe are important to understand today and what God is doing amongst his people today. The first one I learned is that gifts and callings are based on the spirit, on the spirit not on gender and not on marital status. You don't need to be married to fulfill God's call on your life. You don't need to be married to have God's best for you. God gives gifts and callings regardless. Now there are seasons and in terms of how that operates but from a general picture there's no need to wait around to be married in order to live God's best for your life. I've seen this happen. I've seen it happen in the reverse. I remember talking to, to someone, a, a pastor and his wife and, and a visiting ministry when they came to the church said, you will never grow, your church will never grow unless your wife joins you in the ministry. His wife was doing a different career at the time. She left her career. She became the secretary, secretary of the church. She hated it. What was happening there? That model where the woman is a subset. Now, it could be that the wife is also called in the same direction in the same career in the same vocation but it might not be either and that this model says God has gifted and called us as people so that if we're married or if we're not we're still called to serve him first not called to serve our partners first but called to serve God first the other thing I discovered was that marital gender roles and stereotypes are primarily social not divine constructs <coughs> I learnt this because a man was never around to do things for me. <laughs> I used to be really bad at parallel parking. I was your typical woman. No man came to rescue me, so I learnt how to parallel park all by myself. <laughs> and now I park like a man. <laughs> I used to be bad at technology. Desperately wanted a man to fix everything, but no man came. So I learnt to do it myself. I used to be scared of killing spiders. I still am. <laughs> it's true there are differences in our genders, of course, but we must never use those differences or those peculiarities as a limitation for what God can do. God has gifted each one of us individually, 
uniquely. He has a purpose for every single one of us that's unique to our personality and he doesn't want us to put limitations on ourselves because of what society says. The last one. I learnt what it means to be a co-image bearer of God. What it means to join with men equally in this God mission that we've been given, male and female, created together to reflect the image of God together. For so long, the church believed that women was made in the sub-image of God. It's a new thought that we're even equal, that we're blessed to understand today. But God wants men and women equally to serve him, regardless of their marital status. I want to finish just thinking of some, some theological thoughts towards singleness, if I may. It's interesting that in Christianity, the, the God that we have came as a single man, isn't it? Out of all the faiths and religions, we should be able to understand this better than anyone. Jesus wasn't married. In fact, he didn't talk about marriage a lot, but he talked about relationships a lot. And even as interesting, sitting in some of those marriage sermons now, I can relate because I apply all those principles to my, rela my relationships, my covenant friendships, the people I mix with. And obviously the sexual aspect isn't there, but it still applies because singles are still called to be in relationship. They're, they're still called to walk in intimacy. They're still called to negotiate what it is to know others and be known. It's not just for the marriage. Jesus was very pragmatic about marriage. The few times that he talked about it, he made this interesting statement when they were having a discussion about divorce. He said, some of you can accept marriage. You know, some, this is for some people. But he said, others, eunuchs was his context at the time. He said, others were born that way or they chose to be that way or they're just not that way. And I think that can be applied to singles today. Some, some have chosen to be single, some don't want to be married, and some just aren't married. He was pragmatic about it. But what he didn't do was elevate one status above the other. Paul had the same approach. The reverse for him was true. In the Corinthian church that he writes about, 1 Corinthians 7, they had the opposite problem that we do today. Sometimes in our culture today, we idolise marriage. It's kind of like the goal, the ultimate. This is what I'm born for, I'm dreaming of, I'm thinking about, I'm waiting for. All my hope is in this prospect. But Paul's problem was in that particular church, it was better to be single. People were asking the question, should I split from my partner? so that I can follow God. And Paul's advice was this, I want you to stay in the status that you've been called in. Just, just stay there. You don't need to seek to be married. You don't need to, you don't need to split apart. For me, he says, I, I, I love being single. He had the gift of celibacy. I, I often wonder about that gift. <laughs> I don't have it. Anyone here have it? I talk to a lot of singles and to be honest, I've never met one who does have it. <laughs> Paul was pretty special. I would rather be single. I've never met a person who's actually said that in practicality. So good on you, Paul. <laughs> but I think what Paul was saying here is that it, it, you don't have to be married to be close to God. You don't have to be single to be married to God. Sorry, you don't have to be single, you don't have to, be single to love God. Both are equally good in God's eyes. Both are possible for you to fulfill your destiny. I remember chatting uh, after a message one time overseas and a woman came up to me, she would have been about 25, and she comes up and she says, so Tanya, um, I can do it. Uh, what do you mean? She said, I, 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 can, I can live my dream. Yeah. I, I don't have to wait till I'm married. Yeah, you don't. You can flourish in God's purpose in any season of life. Having said all that, I think as a, as a way of finishing, I also think it's very important to acknowledge this truth as well, that when God created the world, when he made the sun, moon and stars, he said, this is good. He made the animals and the plants and the trees and he said, this is good. It's all good. Good, 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 good. Except one thing. It wasn't good. What was it? It is not good. For humanity to be alone. Part of being human is to want to love and to be loved. 
and that singles fall into this category as well. And the truth is that God is not all that we need. God is a spirit. He's not there to greet us when we come home from a hard day of work and say, how was your day? God will not rescue me from the party when I'm standing there with my drink all alone with no one to talk to. God will not be my plus one when I go to that wedding and watch my friend get married again. (laughs) Well, not again. (laughs) Bridesmaid eight times. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) All those dresses. We need relationships. We need people. We need to manage this well. We need to look after our souls in that process and there's some, some, some principles that we need to learn to live by that I hope we're going to pick up some of those in the panel. But I want to finish with this. I went ahead and I, I planted my church. We built a great church. We saw God do some wonderful miracles and I remember about two years into it, we just finished our night service, we packed everything away and I was driving home reflecting on the evening, I'd tried some different things with the sermon. I'd preached on the Good Samaritan. We'd tried some creative ways of doing that. And I was just smiling to myself about some of the things that had happened. And I began to think about the journey. I began to think about all the things that God had done and the miracles that he'd brought about, the people that he'd brought along. I began to think about the people he brought specifically to encourage me, that would stand around me, that would talk to me afterwards, encourage me and say, Tanya, you're doing a great job when I felt like there was no one there to assist me. And I remember thinking back and thinking as I did that, this deep sense of joy rose up inside of me. I felt it. And I thought to myself, God, I love this. I can do this. I am a leader. I am a pioneer. I have gifts. And you know me better than I know anybody. God, I know what your purpose is for my life. I started to grow up. That wheel had started to find who it was. And that was my journey. It's not everyone's journey. And people have different experiences of marriage and singleness. But I think it teaches us something about the heart of God. Marriage is a blessing. The truth is, I still would like to get married one day. That promise still stands. I'm just praying it will happen before I hit the nursing home. (laughs) But I often say, you know, I don't need a husband. I would like one. That would be great. I wouldn't have to worry about getting another flatmate every time my flatmate gets married. (laughs) I wouldn't have to worry about trying to find someone to go on holidays with me. (laughs) But in the meantime, God has provided me with wonderful friendships. God has provided me with the people I need around me. God has given me and blessed me with joy and contentment. He's helped me to see what my identity is regardless of my status in marriage. He's helped me to understand my gifts and my callings. And if I wanted to say anything to singles today is to encourage you to pursue the call of God on your life, mm-hmm. is to seek him first. Yeah. Yeah. Genesis 3.16 says, Your desire will be for your husband. He will rule over you. I've become to understand that particularly for women, there's a turning towards a man to fulfil themselves. But God wants to fulfil every one of us in and who we are, regardless of the people that we join with along our path. And as we do that, we can pray. God, bring me together to connect with the right people in covenant relationship.